has ever been filmed like this before or since. The Patterson-Gimlin film is an icon to many Americans who believe in the existence of Bigfoot and to those who claim to have seen one. And the massive bicep in the arm is, you know, wide like that. It has defied explanation since 1967. And as it moved, you could see the muscles ripping in the thighs and, and, the, and, the, and the arms, even underneath that hair, you could see the difference in the, in the, you know, in the movement. Is it history's most clever hoax? This is a singularity. Therefore, it becomes super important. Or is it real? When that creature disappeared, it disappeared up that dr uh, drainage there. Only one man alive knows for sure, Bob Gimlin, for he was there. The last time Bob Gimlin was at this uh, film site was October 20th, 1967. He tells his story for the very first time on television tonight. And what made you decide to do this particular interview? I feel in my heart that you're sincere about everything that you're talking to me about and that you're filming me about. I know you're not lying. Are these 952 frames of 16 millimeter film footage the best evidence that there are huge man-like apes living in North America? You usually don't see these type of movement amplitudes in walking. More importantly, does this film have more to tell? The legs walleye in and then kick outwards, walleye in and kick outwards. The key to the Patterson-Gimlin film is the walk. I would defy anyone to duplicate it exactly. So the knees are going in and out, in and out. Very strange. If this is a guy in some ape-like suit, he clearly is walking funny. My parents were honest people, and I was raised to be honest. Here you have a, a large muscle here, which is called the biceps, so more so the hamstring muscle group. Cryptozoologist by profession, and driven by her own mysterious encounter, Autumn Williams travels the world. Thousands of people can't have seen something that doesn't exist. All we need is proof. Sometimes at dawn, or the edge of dusk, there's a fleeting glimpse of an impossible sight. Do you have it? You get it. I see it. What's the range? The sightings are real. The technology cutting edge. Are you ready for mysterious encounters? There was times when I, I, I really regretted that I was there and saw it because of the ridicule and because of my wife being upset at me and practically thinking about divorcing me because of the thing, you know, and, uh, and the people saying they faked this and faked that, and, you know, and uh, it, it just, it bothers a person. Bluff Creek, California is as rugged today as in 1967. It is here the Encounters team and I have come to investigate firsthand the famous Patterson-Gimlin film site and to meet a man who rode his horse into these mountains forever changing his life and countless others, including mine. Bob Gimlin was part of a two-man team that obtained one of the most controversial films in history on October 20th, 1967. Is Bigfoot a living, breathing species or simply a legend? You'll be the judge. When I saw this thing, uh, it's almost unexplainable how I felt. I thought, you know, here I am. I've been here, but I'm tired, but this, this thing is real. The Patterson-Gimlin film subject displays an interesting feature here, indicating that it's walking on very flat, flexible feet. The 16-millimeter film footage was not the only evidence of Gimlin and Patterson's encounter. A set of clear, deep footprints were cast and offered as evidence to corroborate the film subject's reality. The footprints exhibit a very unhuman characteristic. I got up on a stump approximately 36 inches high and jumped off with a cowboy boot on into the soil to, uh, to illustrate how deep my boot would go in. Gimlin's boot barely dented the soil beside deep tracks made by a creature that supposedly doesn't exist. Replicating the prints and the circumstances surrounding them may give us a better picture of what really happened. 
Animation expert Ruben Steindorf from Vision Realm will be able to recreate a perfect replica of the creature's foot in 3D animation. And luckily from the footage, they were able to get these casts in the same location. And so when I actually work on the feet, I'll be able to use these casts as a good point of reference. When he's going through the leg swing, there is some outward rotation here. I really don't think that back then they had the technology to pull something like this off. Huge human-like footprints are found frequently in this area. The encounters team investigated one such track find. You know, put the chills on my spines. I knew that, that it was Bigfoot again that was, this time left some, you know, evidence of track. I could take you to the way the tracks are. And you found the tracks? Yes. Yeah. Whereabouts are they? Uh, what? They're down there on uh, south, uh, south end of Hoopa there uh, and Carpenter's uh, fishing hole. Something's hollering down by the river bar. A huge bear track back over there. You can see where he stepped. This oh, was a few ones. days ago, and it was clearer before. Yeah, it was, okay. yeah, yeah, it was clear. It was happening on a Tuesday, and we're we're talking Saturday right now. You got one? Okay. Uh, and just a big toe. I say it was that long. That was just a big toe. The detailed tracks we had hoped to find weren't there, but sometimes evidence presents itself when you least expect it. Did you hear that? I sure did. That sounded just like that. I heard that. I well, heard I it earlier. Yeah, you did I, hear that? Oh, yeah, and I zoned it out. No, that was something. That's the second time I've heard that since we've been here. It wasn't that far away. While strange screams echoing through a river canyon are intriguing, their source is not easily identifiable. But what Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin filmed that day in 1967 is still considered the best Bigfoot images to date. But was it real? One thing that amazes me is that I'm seeing what appears to be an injury or hernia on the right thigh. And you can see it bumping out here. I just think this footage is so understudied. I mean, nobody has noticed that lump in over 37 years. I mean, it's been a long time, and I think that serious scientific analysis is finally warranted on this film. We came around that tree and this thing was standing right alongside the creek. It automatically started walking away as quick as I saw it. I wasn't a confirmed believer that these things really existed. Bob Gimlin tells his amazing story for the first time on TV when Mysterious Encounters returns. Because I thought, well, there's a lot of people out there looking for Bigfoot, and somebody's going to do the same thing we did. And, you know, and it's been 35 years, and they haven't. These kind blue eyes hold a mystery. Bob is the only person still living who was there that day, seeing the creature not on a flickering film screen, but in living, breathing color with his own eyes. I imagine it to be something like an astronaut marveling at how bright the moon is tonight and remembering when he stood on its surface. Ha! Roger had gotten a phone call. They'd put a water tank in up in the mountains where they were planning on building logging roads. And when they came back on uh, Tuesday morning after Labor Day weekend, there was three different sizes of apparently big footprints is what they thought they were. And the time we left up there, it was the last part of September, and we ended in the Bluff Creek area. That's what we rode out of every day, then came back in the evenings. Hey, let's head up to Bluff Creek. The weather was great in October, like uh, this is around here right now. You know, maple leaves and everything was turning as normal in an October, uh, you know, frosty short nights. So Roger said, let's ride back up some of them areas that we had covered before. I found prints up there last week. Good, yeah. We rode up that way, uh, up that creek bed away from our camp, which was probably a couple of miles. As we came around a downfall tree with a root system in the dirt, like a crow's nest, logs jammed together. As we came around that, then, uh, of course, the horses just blew up. Then this thing was standing on the opposite side of the creek that we were on. It was massive. 
I would imagine it, it was thinking about crossing the creek. When I first saw it, uh, it was not looking directly, I don't think, at me. And the commotion of trying to get the camera out of the uh, saddlebags while his horse was jumping around. I was watching the creature and it was walking away. But I could see the face real good and I could see the eyes. By the time we got the horses kind of settled down, and Roger got off with the camera, ran across the creek, and Roger had the camera to his eye. Then he stumbled kind of and fell down on his knees, and then he got back up and he ran over to a log that was a little ways away and stabilized himself on the log. At that time, I rode across the creek on my horse and just sat over there. The creature makes a turn, slight turn with his shoulders and kind of looked back. That's when I rode across the creek on the horse. That's when it made that, that gesture. I was looking at it from the back. There were some trees or vegetation that was getting between Roger and the creature, and he wanted to get him. So he relocated, and when he did, he asked me if I would cover him, which meant get the rifle and, and see. There was no intent to shoot this thing at all. The creature just kept right on walking, and uh, of course it went out of sight. Make sure what I got, I ran out of film. But the chase didn't end there. Patterson and Gimlin tracked the creature up the creek bed for miles. And I, I kind of wanted to follow it on the horse and put film back in the camera. Then we went on and went the same direction that the creature went. We could see scuffs in the gravel. And then it went right up into the cliffs. There was no way you could ride there. Steep mountain cliff. Over three decades have gone by since that day. I want to know if the latest in forensic technology can shed new light on something that happened so long ago. This right here is Bluff Creek, and this is approximately where Roger started shooting the film subject. The evidence will be put to the test when Mysterious Encounters returns. About frame one, just before as we start to see it. put some time in there, but we were extremely lucky. The Encounters team has come to Bluff Creek, California, about 100 miles north of Eureka, to investigate firsthand the famous site of the Patterson-Gimlin footage, and to meet the ultimate witness, a man who was there, Bob Gimlin. Roger contacted me and wanted me to bring him and come down here. And so I, I couldn't do that right away. So I had a little ranch up there and had a few head of cattle, and so I had to get somebody to take care of them. So I did, and by the time we left up there, it was the last part of September. For seven days, they saw nothing. All that changed on October 20th. What Patterson and Gimlin saw and filmed that day has raised as many questions as answers. Reconstructing a three-dimensional image of the creature's face and body, as well as the film site, may give us a better understanding of what happened. Uh, looking at this face as an animator and an artist, uh, there's nothing really over the top about the uh, features of it, and it uh, doesn't really look like anybody had just you know, made it up. Pete Travers took this piece of footage and put it on a light table with backlit, and then actually sketched over it to work out some of the finer details here in the hair and the eyes. As you can see, it's a little bit more human-like and less monster-like without the uh, facial hair, less of a monster. Wow. It's not an animal. It's a, it's a human. It's some form of a human. I think it's really hard for the general public to fathom that there could be a creature out here that's not been discovered here in North America and in other countries because we have this, this kind of feeling that we have the entire world figured out. It doesn't look like a monster. It doesn't look like a figment of someone's imagination. Over the years, interest in studying the creature's face may have distracted researchers from an even more important clue within these same frames. In May of 2000, video expert and wildlife researcher Doug Hycheck transferred the original film to high-definition television for added resolution. 
Hijack spotted a large lump on the creature's leg that had gone unnoticed. After literally hundreds of hours of studying the Patterson footage, I noticed a bulge on the upper right quadriceps. I'm not a biomechanics expert, so I've sent it off to other biomechanics experts to look at. It's probably either some kind of morphology or pathology, meaning an injury. It looks suspiciously like a hernia. And as I loop the footage back and forth, I can see this bulge pop out and then disappear and go flat when the leg is straight. Was it an injury or something else? Here was, would be the quadriceps. It looks more like a, uh, a well-developed muscle. And given the fact that we don't see a lot of knee locking, you would need these muscles. There's going to be a point in time during a gait where the left or the right leg supports the complete weight of the animal. Ruben Steindorf, a forensic animator with Vision Realm, has been given the task of recreating not just the face of the creature, but the entire Bluff Creek scene in a 3D virtual matrix. Now that we recreated this film subject, I'm now going to create the environment in which the subject moves across in, and I have a detailed map here of the path that it takes. We're finally going to be able to see what went down from any angle in this environment. The fascinating reconstruction later in the show. You'll actually be able to see Roger and Bob coming around a bend when they first see the film subject. Right here is the log. It's where the creature actually turned and looked right at us. I still, in my mind, know exactly how this film site looked look then. And I'm probably going to be a little bit disappointed tomorrow when I go there, as grow up, and I know things have to change. The memory of it, what it was and how it walked and where it was at that time, it will never leave me. It's in your memory. It's in yes. your brain like it is in no one else's since Roger passed. You're the last person who has that. That's true. Gimlin has never returned to the original film site. Until now. We came in uh, down through Happy Camp and uh, that way. And I pulled as much bark off those trees as I could and covered those tracks. At a location called Bluff Creek for signs of a reported Bigfoot creature. For seven days, they saw nothing. Oh my God. All that changed on October 20th. The Encounters team has come to investigate firsthand the famous site of the Patterson-Gimlin footage and to meet the ultimate witness, a man who was there, Bob Gimlin. I was kind of disappointed in the, in the original film because I thought, well, uh, he, it should have been able to get more than that. But then I took into consideration, I'm not, I, I didn't have nothing to do with cameras or anything. I thought, well, you know, Roger was running part of the time and he was trying to relocate part of the time. And these things happened so rapidly, it was just like happening like, you know, heartbeats. Bob Gimlin, who has never returned since that fateful day, is about to take a long-awaited hike down memory lane. I'm probably going to be a little bit disappointed when I go there, and I know things have to change, change, change. Could be this one 30 years ago that's dead now. It's the same yeah. height as the boulder. Everything has changed. Are we going too fast? That's about the size of the log would have been. And then the log he stabilized himself on was about like where that stump is there. So it's hard for me to really identify the exact spot. So it's got to be down there. I think we've hit Scorpion. No, we haven't yet. It's quite a ways up. Well, there's a big old stump over there. Really an eerie looking place. That tree is right in the middle of that rock. This, this whole sandbar right here would have been open. Roger fell off. And this is the film site right over here. It's a downed tree right there. I think that's the tree, guys. Awfully close. Well, it was like this type of soil. This is the spot. Well, it's got to be. Of course, the creek would have been way over there. The exact film site location is as elusive as the creature itself. We're ready to leave. We don't want to get caught in Bluff Creek in the dark. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't want to do that.
While the Bluff Creek site may not yield any new clues, can 21st century forensics? Ruben Steindorf of Vision Realm Animation has completed his 3D recreation. This amazing 3D animation will be further detailed and then rendered with many different camera angles, giving clues to the creature's reaction, behavior, and gait. Dr. Jürgen Kunzak, associate professor of biomechanics at the University of Minnesota, has been asked to examine the unusual gait of the Patterson creature. Looking closer at this Patterson footage, I think we can conclude that this type of gait clearly has some peculiarities, features, the lifting uh, of the legs, the, the outward rotation uh, of the knees and of the hips that make it peculiar. The gait does look different than a human gait. There's no doubt about it. Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Associate Professor of Anatomy and Anthropology at Idaho State University, examined the overall physiology of the Bluff Creek creature. There are a number of features of the uh, pattern of the gait and movement of the subject of the Patterson-Gimlin film that speak to its authenticity. Features that include a, a sort of a wall-eyed carriage of the knee and, and leg that uh, combined with a high stepping gait allow this relatively long foot to clear the ground. All these aspects combined with the apparent anatomy suggest that this is much more than simply a man in a fursuit. I'd say if you're out there looking for them, use a lot of common sense and try not to destroy them. Good advice coming from a man who has done what so many others have tried and failed. Meeting Bob Gimlin face to face, seeing the conviction in his eyes, conviction that is mirrored in the eyes of similar witnesses all across the country, leads me to believe that there really is something to all these mysterious encounters. Up until his death, Roger Patterson, who had received small royalties from the film, and Bob Gimlin, who had not profited from it, always agreed that what they saw and filmed was a genuine Bigfoot creature. No firm evidence yet has surfaced to cast doubt on this truly amazing film.